Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks, Peter, for joining us. Um, uh, my pleasure. Absolutely. Okay, so I'm just going to do a little logistics at the front end. Okay. And um, and then we'll get started. Oh, hold on one sec. Connor, I'm going to just rename you to be our class. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, so welcome everyone. I'm Ching Yi Chen. I'm faculty in the Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences at the University of Washington Basel. And I'm really pleased to welcome you to this talk and conversation with Peter Baggio uh, this afternoon. And this talk is part of the University of Washington Labor Colloquium. Um, and just want to thank some sponsors the From the Convergence Zone Reading Series and the Harry Bridges Center. And also my other faculty colleagues at UW Basel Labor Colloquium especially my colleague Dan Berger and then I want to thank the graduate students who will be assisting today Atlanta Duncan on zoom um, and if anyone on zoom needs any tech support you can message Atlanta and the Connor James who's our peer facilitator for the labor stories class um, and this talk is going to be recorded and available at a later date in the Utah Basel labor colloquium archives so folks um, may be watching it later who aren't here right now um, so this event is hosted by University of Washington Bothell, which was built upon the unceded homeland of the Willow Sammamish people. Our campus also touches on the shared waters of tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. And then in addition, this area has been shaped by the labor of Chinese, Japanese, and Filipino laborers who built rail lines and worked in crop fields, logging camps, and salmon canneries, and African American workers who worked in shipyards. Uh, what this means for me as an educator and writer living in the region is to commit to learning about the history and culture of these communities and also to have my students learn about the history and culture of these communities uh, to show solidarity for the continued fight for indigenous sovereignty and to work on decolonizing our educational practices including whose history stories and lineages we center in our writing practices and education and so that is one of the goals of the the series of talks um, uh, I hope that this is one contribution to that effort, and I'm going to encourage you know everyone to consider how you can individually and communally contribute to this work that is meaningful to you. So now I'm excited to introduce Peter. Peter Bacho is the author of um, Cebu Dark Blue Suit, Boxing in Black and White, Nelson's Run, Entries, and Leaving Gessler, um, as well as the book that. Um, we're chatting about today, Uncle Rico's Encore. Encore. His books have received several awards, including the 1992 American Book Award. He is a writing professor at Evergreen State College, and as a child, he lived with his immigrant parents in migrant worker camps, traveling from harvest to harvest. Much of his youth was spent in Seattle's blue collar and multi ethnic central district, a place of hard lives and tough times. He was the first in his family to graduate from high school, then college, and finally law school. These experiences continue to inform his writing. So thank you. And I'm gonna pass it over to Peter. Thank you, Ching. And it's a, uh, an honor to be here. Again, I was here last year, but uh, uh, students here are, are very fortunate since this is the focus of the class of the program is on labor history. You are in a rich territory indeed, in terms of the early part of the 20th century. Um, I don't know if, if uh, students are familiar with Carlos Bolusan's classic America's in the Heart. Do I have any hands here? Has anyone ever read it, America's in the Heart? You're getting no hands. Uh, okay. does, yeah, is, are, are, are people familiar with Bolusan and, and America's in the Heart? It's another. It's kind of a memoir slash novel. It's, it's he he exaggerates certain things, but certain things he also gets right dead to, um, uh, right. It's a, it's a bullseye in in terms of uh, how do people at the bottom uh, manage to succeed? People who are hated, whether you're talking about African Americans, Filipino Americans, Mexican Americans, or whatever. The, the people who had uh, the, the, the occupied the, the lowest rung in, in society's specking order, how do they resist? And, and one of the answers is they formed very militant and powerful labor unions. And he describes it. Um, for him, unionization 
uh, 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 under uh, a progressive banner, and by progressive, you, you can substitute communist banner, <laughs> was, was the way to go. Uh, and, and they organized in the fields up and down the West Coast. And, and more importantly, they organized in, in the Alaskan canneries. Uh, so you have this, this very, very militant uh, union movement up and down the West Coast, including Cal uh, the state of Alaska, which wasn't, or, or the territory of Alaska, which wasn't a state at that time. Um, and if you to trace, you know, a, a Filipino's life cycle, and I include my father and my uncles in this, it was to work the fields um, uh, uh, in, in um, the summer, well, no, they, they would work the fields, uh, and in the spring, uh, they would go to Alaska to work in the canneries, come back, uh, rest up, and then and then begin working the fields until it was time to, 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 to go back to Alaska to get dispatched. And Seattle was the home of, of, of what became ILWU, Longshore Warehouseman's Union, Local 37, which was a famous union. I mean, they, they sent thousands of workers, mostly uh, Filipino workers, uh, to the canneries, and, and they were able, um, unlike working in the fields, uh, where it's hard, it's hard to organize workers working, because they're always moving, right? Uh, but but the, uh, but in, 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 in the cannery system, you stayed at one cannery, and it was easier to organize. Uh, and and this was a key industry, um, especially during World War II, when, you know, canned salmon, hey, this is what the troops ate, right? And um, um, the, the story is, is itself, and I've gotten into it, the story itself uh, is a very powerful one of effective resistance to the system that they found themselves in, 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 involved in or, or, or stepped on by, right? Um, and so I have a piece in here, it's called Bad Attitude, and I'm going to eliminate the bad attitude that these old timers my dad's generation passed on to myself and, and, and my peers. We, were, we had kind of a bad attitude too. <laughs> it's inherited from our fathers. <laughs> but uh, my focus is, is on these early uh, pioneers. And I'll read you an excerpt. I sit here remembering, knowing that the first generation has vanished and that their children have had children, perhaps grandchildren too. And that these stories, their stories, although they have much in common with the stories of other immigrants from Asia, Manong's attitude of defiance is unique. Such stories have not been told or if told, have been forgotten or not listened to by too many younger Filipinos. But that indifference may be slowly changing. Young Filipinos have gone to Delano, California. And I don't know if, if folks here have studied the Delano grape strike, but it was a massive strike back in 1965. Eh? Visiting, writing about, and producing films focused on Larry Itliong and the pivotal Filipino role in the 1965 Delano grape strike. In terms of shining defiant moments in Pinoy history, it is hard to top Itliong and the Delano Pinoys were what they did in 1965. But such a moment does exist. In Seattle, it's all but forgotten detail described in a lawsuit argued before the U.S. Supreme Court, ILWU Local 37 versus Boyd. The date is 1954. Every spring, Local 37 spent thousands sent thousands of Pinoys north to the Alaskan salmon canneries, but the United States was in the middle of a communist hunting tsunami unleashed by Senator Joseph McCarthy and Boyd, the Seattle-based District Director of Immigration and Naturalization Services, INS, was more than happy to do his part. In 1953, Boyd's office twisted federal immigration law and threatened, within quotes, to treat aliens domiciled in the continental United States returning from temporary work in Alaska as if they were aliens entering the United States for the first time, end of quote. By 1953, many of Local 37's members had become American citizens against whom Boyd's threat would not apply, but others were not. 
When the Philippines became independent in 1946, it cut the legal tie between America and its former colony. It also changed the status of thousands of Pinoys. Overnight, and despite decades in America, they lost their status and their protection as American nationals. Aliens are what they became. And under US law, aliens seeking entry to this country for the first time could be excluded for any number of reasons, including disfavored political affiliations. Chris Mansalvas, the locals president, was the unreachable itch that triggered Boyd's obsession. Among Filipinos, the one-legged Mensalvas was legendary, committed, courageous, tough. And Pinoy's no stranger to hardship, admired these traits. But he was also an unabashed communist, unforgivable during the paranoia of the McCarthy era, when many Americans yearned for peace and for simple answers to the questions raised by an increasingly complex and hostile post-war world. In 1945, the United States and its allies had defeated fascism. Yet, just the next year, 1946, Winston Churchill warned of an iron curtain caused by the Soviet Union's aggressive westward expansion. Then in 1949, China, an important wartime ally, fell to communist forces in that country's civil war. And finally, in 1950, American soldiers were battling Chinese communists on the Korean Peninsula. The speed and sheer scope of the global changes were breathtaking, and not at all to America's liking. Within this unsettling milieu, Senator Joe McCarthy provided the snake oil to soothe the nation's jangled nerves. Subversives, he claimed, were the problem, and he knew who they were. Communists and sympathizers could be found in government, universities, labor unions, and the arts. His charges, most of which were unfounded, were dutifully reported by a meek and uncritical American press. But in the early 1950s, the McCarthy era had shaped the tenor of American life, giving rise to blacklists, arrests, guilt by innuendo and association, terminations, and ruined lives. And this is something that's really interesting. I mean, it's like the union headquarters <laughs> and, and INS in those days, that branch of the INS, they're within walking distance, less than half a mile away, about a half a mile away, maybe. In those days, the INS building and Local 37's headquarters were within walking distance of each other. It must have galled Boyd and other immigration officials that a communist-led union could be so brazen as to openly operate and thrive in the agency's backyard, hence the threat in 1953. INS's goal, I am sure, was to force the rank and file to remove Mensalvas but he continued as president until 1959, for five years after McCarthy was censured by the Senate and two years after McCarthy's death in 1957. And each spring, and despite the threat, Local 37 would send Pinoy's North for decades to come. But why were these workers, most of whom were not communists, so unfailingly loyal to a marked man? For starters, group solidarity strengthened by years of racial hostility had become an article of faith shared by members of the first Filipino generation. This is how we survive. But that's not all. In 1984, I wrote this about Mensalvas. They stayed loyal to Chris because he understood them and their needs, and he spoke their language. That was his magic. He could speak to anyone, and that person would believe, or would at least want to believe, Chris's talent, that human touch, worked in spite of his ideology, not because of it. In retrospect, the rank and file's defiance was both brave and audacious, 
during a time when other Americans drew their shades and cowered in their homes. And turncoats kept busy naming names, but not at Local 37, where union members made abundantly clear that they, not the federal government, would choose who they wanted to lead them. That's our decision. It's who we are, the old Pinoy said. And oh, one more thing, Mr. Boyd, Mr. Big Shot, Mr. Polished Floor Shine Shoes, fuck you. So uh, that ties it in, I think. And and the Christmas Salvas, if you ever get around to reading Bulusan, he is uh, named Jose. Uh, the fiery labor leader and, and, and his accident, how he lost his leg is described uh, in the narrative itself. Any questions that students might have or just take notes? You've taken, been taking notes. I've, I've almost got 45, I've got about 45 years in front of a classroom. So I know how this works. Any questions? Open it up. Well, we have a lot of questions that the students already submitted, but um, they also have no cards. So okay. So if you have new questions from listening to, you know, what was just read, you can write them down on your note cards um, and Connor and, and maybe raise your hand and Connor can come. Um, um, and, and we can also try the owl if, if you want to ask it directly. Um, and if you're on Zoom, um, you can direct message it to Atlanta. We have a little Google Doc in yeah. LC. And, oh yeah, it can, it can be put in the chat, and I can answer the question. I can repeat the question, or read the question, and then answer it for for students. So, so um, yeah, so don't don't be shy because this is um, you know our chance to talk to the author about the book that you read. Um, but Peter, I was wondering, um, you know, while we're giving them a chance to formulate their questions, uh, if you could talk a little bit about. Um, your writing journey, how you became a writer. Um, you know, you've written many books. So, yeah. So, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you about that. I, uh, uh, you know, I, I, once upon a time, I was an attorney and it was really rather boring. And, um, and I, I, I yearned to be, um, you know, at, at the center of things. And uh, there was this guy, Arnaud de Borscrub. I think he wrote for either Time and Newsweek. And I used to follow his copy, but he was, always in interesting places doing interesting things, whether it's reporting on politics or or or, or this or that uh, war in some distant place. Um, and I, I became that to a certain degree. Um, you know, I was overseas. Uh, I covered politics. Uh, I covered uh, you know, everything from politics to combat. I did all that stuff. But um, let, let me tell you something about uh, the, the lure of fiction. Um, as anyone who plays with words extensively, and I was playing with words extensively, getting published in all the right papers, the, all the right journals, um, you know, uh, the academic journals, as well as, as, as uh, uh, the important uh, periodicals. I was getting published there. And this is before, you know, this is before the internet. Uh, and so newspapers really did matter in those days. Uh, um, I, I, I was engaged in policy debates on in print, and um, uh, people listened to, to what I had to say, and uh, that that was uh, satisfying, but not entirely satisfying, because I think, um, I think uh, it, for someone who plays with words, and I don't know how many potential writers we have out there. Uh, if you pl play with words, uh, craft words, craft essays, what have you, uh, about factual things, um, um, I mean, you're 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 dealing with the facts as they exist, and you're doing your analysis or your reportage about things that already exist, <laughs> and and you're predicting if A moves here, then B is this is going to be B's logical response, et cetera, et cetera. And um, at, at some point in time, I, I think uh, uh, many writers who start out this way eventually end up falling prey to the great temptation. And the great temptation of fiction writing is this. Um, 
what if I had a chance to create a universe populated with uh, people that I choose, put them in motion, put them in conflict, and decide how it will all turn out. Uh, that's a very, for me, it was an irresistible sort of lure. And I finally figured out what the rule of, of what, what, what the, what the, um, what the, uh, 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 the, the allure of all of that was, and it is, <laughs> this is the closest as a human being I'll ever get to divinity, because I create this universe, right? I decide who's going to live in it. I decide what happens uh, to that individual. Is that individual going to be happy, or is it going to die tragically? And and that was, that was the, the motivation for my first novel, Cebu, which uh won an american book award is uh, you know I, I thought wow i can tell a story i can i can write a novel and that's the dumbest thing i've ever done in my life it was stupid to 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 have that kind of arrogant assumption well just because i'm i'm good at, at analysis uh, that doesn't necessarily translate into i can uh, write a novel i mean the, the two are are disparate the disparate types of disciplines and it was stupid, but I lucked out. You know, enough people liked it, and I get this nice little award, and so on and so forth. And um, you know, uh, it, it taps into a deeper vein uh, in me to tell other stories. And and and, um, and uh, you know, as 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 when when the muse comes and starts stirring me up. Uh, I can't finish until, whether it takes two years, three years, four years, I can't finish until I, I've done the project. I have to tell the story. Uh, and that's how I operate. And, you know, I guess the muse is, has come forward on seven different occasions. But unfortunately, it doesn't come forward all the time. And uh, most of the time, I, I, I live a, a very normal, peaceful, happy sort of life. But, um, but uh, when when uh, the idea is there and I can see it in my head and I can feel its need to be told, uh, then I become focused and obsessed and uh, I don't rest until I tell the story. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> you were talking about fiction writing and being able to make all these choices. and. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the difference with nonfiction writing. I know you are making choices in nonfiction writing, but but you, it's harder to make certain kinds of choices. Uh, yeah, it is. Um, uh, when when you're um, uh, when 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 you're writing, okay, let, let, let's say I'm doing a, an analytical piece for for the pay, Christian Science Monitor or the LA Times or one of these guys, I'd better be damn good. I'd better be damn accurate. I'd better have uh, uh, all of my facts in order uh, so that I can defend my outcome. Now, with with memoir, and this is what it is, it's, it's a collection of many memoirs uh, uh, about a community, an ethnic community, an ethnic religious community from about 1950 to about 1970, although uh, I, I go a little bit farther than that and take it uh, to, to, to modern time. Uh, but the bulk of it is focused in that era. Um, uh, many memoirs, are, or memoir itself is called creative nonfiction. And there's a reason uh, it is uh, 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 called creative nonfiction. One, one of the reasons is that, uh, you know, a, a good memoir, uh, a good story, uh, even though there is a, a basis in fact, uh, is judged by, uh, is judged by artistic standards. Right. I mean, you're you're using uh, fiction. You're using the techniques you learn in fiction to apply your your storytelling to creative nonfiction. And plus, I say in in, in at uh, at the outset, or actually in the title, uh, it says these are mostly true stories. And that's the, that's the thing about memoirs: your recollection of something. Okay, it's your recollection of an episode, a point in time. Uh, it, it's not a biography where there are footnotes and people are going to check up on you. It's just, and of course, you know, the writer um, uh, is, is going to use his or her imagination to fill in the gaps when, when, you, when you can't 
uh, exactly remember what it was that happened. Okay, or all, all the facts, all the details. Uh, you know, I can't go word for word. This is the, actually the conversation that occurred on such and such a day, on such and such a time. All right. So what did I do? I I I I I, I I listed in the title itself. It was mostly true stories, and, and certainly there, there's a story in there. The fishing man, the fishing man. It's, it's one one of my favorite stories, um, in, in which uh, the great baseball uh, player um, Ted Williams. Uh, you guys are much too young to remember who Ted Williams was, but believe me, in my day, he was he he was uh, uh, he was the man, or he was one of the men. And uh, after he retired from his 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 uh, his uh, 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 job as, as as a player for Boston Boston Red Sox, uh, he became the uh, the, the spokesman uh, for uh, all things sports for 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 the Sears catalog, right? I mean, there he was in the Sears catalog. You guys are. I don't think they even send out a Sears catalog anymore. But in the '60s, '50s, and '60s, and before that. And that was something to look forward to. Take a look at the Sears catalog, and there's Ted Williams. Well, in the scene that that I have, here's here's Ted Williams uh, uh, suddenly appearing in the middle of my living room, talking about fishing and what I can do and what I can't do, and you know this is too expensive. Uh, but this is how I think we 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 get you started in this. I wanted to be a fisherman. I wanted to fish. And uh, I listened to Ted Williams for advice. No, of course, that didn't happen. You know, no one's fooled by that. Uh, it's a, but it's a damn good story. Great. So does anyone, now I'm gonna open it up. Does, it, does the folks have questions? Okay, I see some hands. So let's try, let's try and see if Peter can hear you. And, and why don't you say your name too? Well, I mean, the thing is- Is that Ching, uh, Ching in? If I can't hear, then you can repeat the question because I can hear you just fine. Okay, you can hear me. Great. Um, so my question was, uh, my name's Max. Uh, Hi, Max. My question was, so when you got the idea for this project, uh, this collection of stories, like this memoir, did you, I'm just kind of curious of your process of how you compiled the stories, I guess. So yeah. did you write them out like chronologically where some of them are already written and you decided to add them to the collection? Right, but they kind of well, I'll give you a Thank you. That's a very, very good question. And um, uh, and and let me let me tell you the the backstory on all of this. The first story came out on 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 September. It, it was nearing September twentieth, uh, two thousand eighteen. And a friend of mine was doing these little shorts, and I thought, you know, it'd been about eight years since I'd, I'd written my last creative work, uh, which no one read, by the way, <laughs> leaving, leaving Yesler. It's a nice little book. Um, and I, I was thinking back, there, there are, 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 you know, there, there are key moments in, in a human being's life, and, and you will remember all of the details, of, or most of the details of these key moments. Now, September 20th, 2018 was the 50th anniversary of my 18th birthday. I was 68 at the time, right? And on my, on my 18th birthday, I was at the induction center uh, the U.S. Army Induction Center uh, on the west side of Queen Anne Hill. I, I, I'm sure it's no longer there. And uh, I was filling out my papers, getting ready to join the Army, and getting ready to get shipped out to Vietnam. Okay? Uh, <laughs> as many, many of my friends were doing. And, and so that was kind of inspirational to me. I, I thought I should mark this. Um, and and I liked what I had written, and that led to other stories, okay, which eventually led to, to enough stories to fill a collection. I'll read you the, uh, the uh, September 20th, 1968. I'll read that, okay? This is, this is the first in the, first in the collection. Uh, go ahead. Oh, tell us what page, page you're on so people are following along with you. Oh, 115. Go ahead. Ready? Okay, here we go. Could it really have been that long ago? 
the first day of my 18th year and I'm spending it at the military induction center in Seattle. Me and other accidental boy soldiers filling out forms, taking tests, bending over, just bobbing along in a white fruit of the loom sea. I glanced around the room. Not many razors needed. I was a product of Catholic schools, deferred sexuality and stations of the cross sublimation, a virgin. But I knew I wasn't the only one. I also knew that some of them weren't coming back. And on their tombstones, it should read, poor, poor, fill in the name. The only tit he ever sucked was his mom's. Was I scared? Too strong. Apprehensive? That fits. I wrote to the induction center started the year before in the spring of 1967 when I got a call from a high school pal, Steve Aspiris. We were juniors at the time and the Vietnam War was too far down the road to worry about. Besides, as a soon to be senior at O'Day High, I had more important things to worry about like a high hopes basketball season. Steve said he'd drive and we'd be joined by Ted Davina, Vince Visaya, Gene Navarro, the other three slightly older than Steve and me, their high school years, a chapter in their past. As we cruised the city's neighborhoods and headed downtown, we listened to r and just hanging out, an activity at which Filipino Americans of my day excel. Among the jokes and banter, the camaraderie, the comfort that comes with a common ethnic history and a shared, common ethnic identity and a shared history, Gene suddenly dropped a bomb. He'd signed with the Marines, he said, his tone matter of fact. He'd be reporting to boot camp in a few days. Ted and Vince would be next, snatched up by the military. For all three, there was only one destination, Vietnam. That's when the war hit home. My time was coming. Gene, Vince, and Ted could have postponed military service by going to college with its life-saving four-year draft deferment. I was hoping to do that. But among too many of my Filipino peers, it wasn't an option. Our immigrant parents came from poverty. In America, they worked in the nation's underbelly, migrating to seasonal backbreaking jobs on farms and in salmon canneries. By the 1960s, their economic situation had improved, but not enough to send their sons to college. My friends also had considered unconsidered options like Canada, but I know what they would have said. Nope, that's what white guys did. Or how about growing their hair, burning their draft cards, and protesting the war? Same thing. Then there was a stereotype prevalent among Seattle's white public high school teachers and counselors that unlike studious and well-behaved Japanese and Chinese boys, yes sir, no sir, three bags full sir, young Filipino males were just not college material. Try the post office, they were told, or learn a trade. Oh, and cut your hair, stop jaywalking, and pay taxes. They smoked, they drank, they talked smack to the ladies and slicked their hair. Homemade, of course, just like their dads. They brawled in the streets. They danced too black. In 1967, give me a break, brother man. That's what white guys did. It's not like Vietnam was the only thing I thought about. But when I did, I had a hard time seeing myself in army green. For starters, I hated the woods, never mind swamps, steamy jungles, rice paddies, killer snakes, and pooping outdoors. Ditto for hiking and sleeping outdoors. Guns and loud noises scared me. Getting shot scared me more. Campfires without s'mores? Forget it. I felt lucky being not yet 17, which gave me more than a year of ongoing adolescence and perhaps enough time to figure things out. Besides, maybe the war would be over by then. Plus, there were the distractions of senior year, the upcoming basketball season, college applications, and with a little luck, maybe even a girlfriend. Everything but the girlfriend went okay. We beat Seattle Prep, our bitter crosstown rival, and qualified for the playoffs where we got bounced in the first game. I even got accepted, despite an exceedingly modest academic record, to the University of Washington. But a girlfriend? I fell one win short of the triple crown. 
Graduation came and went, and I was three months away from turning 18. It was time to get serious about this Vietnam thing, a point driven home by our Filipino Summer League basketball team. As the season wore on, our guys kept disappearing, leaving for basic, leaving for war. Then one day in August, I decided to launch a preemptive strike. I would join the Army, but only under my terms. Since sure, I had been accepted by the UW. My acceptance gave me the pressures to firm it. But how long I could hold on to it was another matter. The truth was that going to the university intimidated me. It was so impersonal, bloodless, soulless, and huge, a city within a city. And I was convinced I would flunk out and become meat for the body hungry draft. And like so many draftees, be sent to the bush to hike and shoot and poop outdoors. I told the recruiter I wanted to be in military intelligence where my ability to type and answer telephones, follow office etiquette, and politely brown nose superiors would be highly valued. I also wanted the six month delayed entry program. It was my plan B after flunking out at the UW. He tried to talk me into the airborne. No thanks, I replied. I signed the paperwork and on my birthday, I reported to the induction center. At the end of what was becoming a tedious day, I had one more step in the process, a meeting with a medical officer. In a sense, I was relieved. The day would finally end, plan B would be underway, and it would have been too, but earlier I had filled out a form asking if I had a history of the listed maladies or diseases. Asthma, I wrote, which was true. As a child, I'd even been hospitalized after a nasty attack. But I outgrew it and became the picture of teenage health, playing football in the fall, basketball in the winter, and baseball in the spring. I entered the doc's office. He was seated behind his desk, and he motioned for me to sit down. As he scanned my medical history, I glanced at his features. Blonde hair with blue eyes, a handsome man who looked younger than his calendar years. He also looked kind, serene like a priest who'd just been sitting at the right hand of God. He looked up and stared at me. I see you've had asthma, he said solemnly. Yes, I had it as a child. That means if you go to a hot, dusty place, there's a chance your asthma could act up. Hmm, I hadn't thought of that. My asthma acting up in a hot, dusty, and violent environment was the least of my worries. I was puzzled, unsure what the doc was getting at. Before I could reply, he repeated himself slowly and more firmly this time, like he was talking to an idiot. That means if you go to a hot, dusty place, ding, I realized he was trying to flunk me out. He was doing his best to give me my life. Yeah, I mumbled, sure. He sat back in his chair, the slightest of smiles forming at the corner of his mouth. I'm afraid you can't join to the army, son. You'll get a one Y instead. A one Y? It means you'll only serve if there's a national emergency. I got up to leave. This was so unexpected. I didn't know what to feel. Half a century later, I can't remember if I thanked him then, but I now know I should have. Because of that doc, I was able to continue in college, go to law school, and screw up a legal career and two out of three marriages. But why the kindness? Maybe it was because he knew that the war couldn't be won. Or maybe it was proof that God really does love fools. Or perhaps it was because the great cosmic joker, Senor Lucky Dog, chose my birthday to drop me a bone. Or maybe it all went deeper, that he knew the war shouldn't have been fought in the first place. Whatever the reason, I know he concluded that I'd be one more teenage discardable in this most dubious of battles. Ah, but the doc didn't know of plan B. 
that I carefully planned to sit out my tour in an office with air conditioning or at least fans. But being 18 and very naive, I didn't realize then that my best laid plan could gang off the glare. Easy enough in a war zone. Every morning for the last several years, I've smudged with tobacco and sage, praying for the well-being of those who are close to me. When his turn comes up, I see his face. This is my prayer. Thank you, Army Doc, who saved my life. So that was the first story, and I liked it. And others liked it too. So uh, um, I, I think I think I can spin a collection out of this and led to other stories. It led to The Fishing Man and, and so on and so forth. And then, of course, um, uh, there are some stories on the heart attack, which led to three more stories. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I would recommend getting a heart attack so that you can be inspired to write. Other questions students might have. I'm having a good time. I saw hands. I also see some writing for questions. Do you have a question? Uh, sure. Yeah. Do you want to ask her? Might as well. Okay, great. Uh, hi, I'm Effie. Um, how would you say that your experience of political and conflict-focused writing translated to your novel-based works? What's that? They're closely connected um, because I, I use the techniques that I I I, I did I applied as a, as a fiction writer precisely to uh, uh, many of the stories here. Some of them are more essay. Some of them are are, are actually you know I think well developed short stories. So I mean uh, you know when you read um, when you read a memoir, it should read like a good work of fiction, like like the most compelling novel. Uh, and, and that comes with applying uh, uh, the, the devices, relying, for example, on, on dialogue and action rather than just simply description to, to carry the same. Um, but uh, they're, they're very, very closely linked sorts of, of areas of writing. And I, I kind of jump across the line on, on a couple of occasions in, in uh, Uncle Rico's Encore. But that's okay. So it's like, you mean to tell me that uh, uh, you know Maxine Kingston and and the woman warrior that that all of that dialogue was exactly as it was spoken? Please give me a break. It's a wonderful book, by the way. But I mean, she borrows, uh, I, I think, very very uh, 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 heavily from from her skills as a fiction writer. Does that answer your question? Okay. Go ahead. So, uh, how much of your writing, um, specifically in the encore, um, kind of involves uh, even talking to uh, some of your friends about events just to clear up uh, blurry memories, like about Van, uh, people like that? I'm not going to talk to Van because he was already dead. It, it involved nothing. I mean, it involved my. Uh, uh, Van the Man, <laughs> we ran together about 20 good years, and um, yeah, that is my recollection, and and um, and when it was done, um, two of my very, very close friends, Ted Davina and, and, and Jimmy Gilmore, uh, I sent them copies, I said, is this how you remember it, and you know, uh, they're not literary types, but they are very close friends. So they nodded off and said, yeah, that's how I remember it. And Van passed away in uh, 2015. He just kind of shrank, keeps shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And uh, uh, and then what, what, what I uh, described there is absolutely true. I mean, <laughs> when we finally got him out. He was a hoarder. All right. And he was a hoarder and a smoker. And uh, uh, the, the, he, his his long lungs were starting to fail, and so our, our last act was to get him out of this horrible place, um, and and get him into uh, uh, subsidized housing, decent subsidized housing. We we accomplished that, but sure enough, his order instincts returned, <laughs> and so his little apartment you could barely walk around in it there too. So I mean, you know. <laughs> um, leopards and spots i guess if they don't change uh just i hope that answers your question yeah okay Other uh, 
for it. Anybody else have questions? Oh, I, Go ahead. Okay. Um, so I uh, kind of touched on it earlier, but uh, initially getting published, uh, was that process kind of, did you have like connections that could kind of? No, I did. I didn't. Um, this is, uh, if you have, uh, 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 um, are, are, are you, do you, do you have an idea of becoming a writer? Myself? Yeah. I think everyone in our class wants to be a writer in some form because it's, because they're here to learn creative writing. Yeah, I didn't. I, I, I did my, like many things in my life, as, as you, as you can tell from, from this memo, I have done them all ass backward. <laughs> So I am the last person to ask. But anyway, uh, Sean Wong, I, I think um, uh, some of you might know him. Ching In, I, I'm sure you know Sean, right? I know Sean. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's a very distinguished uh, writer, professor uh, at the UW main campus in English. He was the chair of the English department for years and years and uh, moved up in administration, et cetera, et cetera. And now in his... And it's, and now in his uh, his golden years, I think he's he's reduced his load somewhat. But um, but uh, uh, he was the guest editor for uh, the Seattle Review, which is a very well regarded uh, creative writing journal. And um, and uh, uh, he offered to publish. We were colleagues at the time. He offered to publish about twenty five pages of of my novel in progress, Cebu. And based upon that, I um, I wrote a note of inquiry to uh, the University of Washington Press because they had developed a reputation for for Asian American literature, uh, but these were republications. Uh, uh, Monica Sone's No No Boy, uh, Carlos Bolosan's America's in the Heart, uh, and the best one of all, John Okada's. Uh, well, John Okada's No No Boy, uh, Carlos Bolosan's America in the Heart, and, and Monica Sone's uh, First Nisei Daughter. And uh, the best of these, I think, is, is Okada's No No Boy. Um, uh, they had developed a, a national reputation for Asian American literature, but they 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 had um, uh, they had specialized in uh, publishing the works. Of, of people of authors who had died <laughs> you know they're no longer around so the republic re republication these were republications of, of what what are now regarded as classic works in asian american lit and so uh and so uh, uh i i sent uh, naomi pascal who's the, the publisher at the time a note and she said she was interested but she wanted to see the entire manuscript and and for those of you who are aspiring to write at some point in time you need an attaboy that um uh, it is a very very lonely process particularly that first work it's very lonely and that was my attaboy Okay, uh, uh, the publication of an excerpt and, and, you know, my initial inquiry to UW, which wasn't a firm no, that they were willing to take a look of a, at, a, at a living, breathing, living, breathing, or still alive Asian American author. And I said, okay, I'm going to finish this. This is the green light. This is the sign from heaven that I've, I've been waiting for. And uh, so, the, you know, I finished it. I sent it to them. And uh, several months later, the reader said, publish. I said, "Yay!" It was. Um, uh, I, I remember. I remember um, in comparison, in terms of just the the tension uh, and uh, 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 just the eruption of joy. Uh, I remember in 1974, which is when I graduated from law school, take the bar, and you wait and wait and wait and wait, uh, and, and and you you wait to see. Uh, if if the letter that you receive from the bar association is a fat packet, okay, uh, because it has all the paperwork you have to fill in to become a, a, a member of the bar, and uh, so I waited, waited, waited until October. One October day, I walked to the mailbox and um, opened uh, uh, opened it and pulled out a fat packet from the state bar association. I jumped so high, <laughs> it's like ah. But um, topping that what was the, the letter, topping that, which I thought was kind of like a highlight of life, uh, was the letter I received from the UW Press um, 
saying that yes, they have agreed to publish this novel, Cebu. It was an even bigger high, and uh, you'll 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 get your your biggest highs as a writer, and you also get your biggest heartbreaks as a writer. Anybody else have a question? Go ahead. Um, Tell us so your name, too. <clears throat> my name's Jacinda. I'm a Filipina as well, but my parents immigrated here when I was younger. Um, I'm not very close with my parents, so I just wanted to ask, like, did you find it difficult to write about um, very vulnerable moments in your life, and, like, how did people around you react to that? Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't, uh, because uh, once you uh, tell yourself you're going to write a memoir, everything's out there. You know, I, I say I admit in, in the memoir, I messed up. I screwed up a number of times, but I'm still alive. To, uh, 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 God loves fools, right? Uh, to, to think about it, laugh about it on occasion, uh, and write about it. Uh, it's all out there. If, it's, if, it, if, if it looks like you're hedging or the reader thinks you're hedging a bit, uh, it comes off as inauthentic and it comes off as enough. It would come off as inauthentic to me as a writer. And uh, uh, I owe myself uh, as well as my readership, but mostly I own myself an, an honest, uh, at least emotionally honest recollection. Were there then stories that you considered for the collection that didn't make it in, or and a, if so, kind of what were maybe the reasoning that you would have chosen certain stories over other ones? I uh, I wanted to include this poem um, about something that happened on on this little boat. I couldn't find it. Maybe that's, I don't know what it was, but something uh, that, that happened on, on this little boat, which indicated, which marked the end of my second marriage. <laughs> uh, and it was uh, with another woman. Uh, and I would have included too, if, 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 I, if I could have found it, I couldn't find it. <laughs> Maybe it was some kind of divine intervention. You shouldn't be talking about that stuff. But I was more than happy to talk about it. I mean, if, if, if you're going to write a memoir, you better be honest. So we had a lot of students ask about the non-chronological nature of the collection um, and wanting to know, you know, why you just, you know, why you decided to choose that structure um, and um, and I'm just seeing if there's any any other specific. Yeah, I think just generally, why did you choose that structure? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the structure um, was was a uh, These were just excerpts. I mean, the collection of short story, collection of short stories, or many memoirs. Um, I'll take credit for the maps. I will take credit for the maps. I, I saw and for for the insistence that that the the press use actual physical maps of these neighborhoods. But the rest of it, um, the rest of it, uh, I credit Mike Backham, my uh, excellent editor uh, at the UW Press. And uh, he ran it by me. I said, that makes sense to me. But um, uh, the, the only thing that, 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 the only aspect of, in terms of organization, the only aspects I'll, I will take credit for uh, is, is the, the, the choice of the maps leading off, that first section. That made perfectly good sense to me because I wanted to establish um, uh, the geography of the place. This was Filipino Seattle. Okay. This is where we lived. Uh, this is what we did here. We played basketball here, got married here, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, made our decisions on Vietnam here. Uh, uh, this is important ground. Uh, of course, you know, with, with uh, generations passing, and uh, 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 gentr gentrification occurring all over the place, uh, this, this physical space no longer exists, except for in our memories of people who actually walked those streets and, and had those experiences. But I wanted to give uh, readers a clearer sense that this was our world. I mean, this is the world that we inhabited. Thank you so much. I think um, maybe I'll, I think students would be interested in hearing about how you worked with your editor, if you want to talk more about that. Because I think it sounds like you had several, you probably have had several different kinds of editors. Um, yeah. 
Mike, Mike was a very encouraging editor. I mean, he didn't make a whole lot of, uh, he, he made a couple of good suggestions, but uh, mostly he was very respectful uh, in, in, in terms of where I was gonna go as a, as a writer and, and what direction I was heading in. So he trusted me and I trusted him and it was a wonderful working relationship. Sometimes you don't get that. Sometimes you get an activist editor. Uh, and um, uh, sometimes that activism uh, um, is, is, is something that's needed. And, and sometimes, particularly as you get older and more experienced as a writer, um, it's not needed at all. Because, uh, you know, as, as, as you become more experienced as a writer, uh, at some point in time, you're going to say, this is pretty damn good stuff. And uh, I am at that stage now, but it's only taken me 20 years to get here. <laughs> I couldn't have said that, you know, 20 or longer than, longer than that, actually. Uh, yeah, longer than that. Uh, I couldn't have said that uh, at, the, at the outset, but I can say that now. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. Or if any Zoom audience before our question. Who's got the question? I can stay afterwards, no big deal. Any other questions? Enjoying the conversation. That was fun. I, I love talking to students. This is what, this is, this is okay, what I do hard. for a living, yeah. right? Um, I guess, generally speaking, do you find fiction to be more fulfilling to you as a creative, right? like writing-wise, than nonfiction is? Or... Well, I mean, uh... Uh, some, some of the... Fiction is, is, there are some essays in here, but the, there's an awful lot of storytelling too. So I, I take my fictional preferences uh, and yeah, I, I, I love a good work of fiction. I love a good work of fiction. And I, I take that love of, of fiction and, and the techniques that are used in fiction uh, to explore a storyline. And I've applied it to at least some, or maybe most of the pieces here, not all of them. But most most of the pieces I've I've I've, uh, I've written as basically standalone pieces, and uh, if if it's got a fictional bent to it, then then I intend it as a completed short story, like the Fishing Man, and um, and um, uh, September twentieth. That that's all true. September twentieth is entirely true, but I I shape the narrative as 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 I would have shaped a a, a short story. Well, thank you so much, Peter, for joining us. Um, it was a treat to, to get to talk to you about your process. Yeah. And um, yeah. I think- Thank you for hosting me. I don't know if I can make a commercial uh, announcement. Go ahead. Uh, I'll be teaching a class in fiction writing at the Hugo House, uh, a virtual class. Uh, uh, and so that's a commercial announcement sometime in April, <laughs> later this month, I think. Great, yeah, Hugo House, is, for those who don't know, is a great uh, writer center in Seattle and Capitol Hill. Um, and and is it a one, is it a one day class? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, uh, four sessions sometime late in, uh, uh, they asked me, that, you know, push your stuff. I said, okay, I'll do that. But I have to ask permission first. Yeah, so you can check it out. And um, just, just, just for folks to know, um, that we are also going to have Bushra Rayman next week at the same time. Um, it's a virtual talk. Um, and I think that, uh, well, for those in the class, you'll be here. And then for if, if on Zoom, if you want to come, um, I think that Atlanta has put the link in the chat. And then there's also some other upcoming UW Bothell Labor Colloquium uh, events that are forthcoming as well that have been put in the chat. So thank you, everyone, so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Peter, and you. Um, hope everyone has a great uh, rest of your afternoon. Yeah, and I will email you and see if there's anything else I need uh, need to do, and you know, just whatever the whatever the bureaucratic hoo ha is. <laughs>